we're good, man. Let's head out. Say again? Oh, <laughs> Mexico has been my home between Isla Mujeres and Cancun for over six months. So this was a time for goodbyes. Again, I've made a lot of good friends here. But it's time to shove off and get this boat out to sea. And here I am tugging out the, uh, the harbor entrance to the marina. And then it's set sails and go. So goodbye to Mexico and hello to the next adventure. This is how I slept probably 80% of the trip. I made a headrest for myself on a line and I just stay at the helm and sleep there. So I'm going to chat a minute. This is not comfortable sailing. If all sailing had to be done in places like this, I, I would sell the boat and go buy a condo. Life is meant to be enjoyed and this is not much fun. However, that said, it is true that I have had success. I mean, I'm sailing with no touch of the wheel right now. Uh, Oh, she's uh, sailing herself. Okay, so what am I talking about here? My boat can sail about 50 degrees to the wind. No more. So wind is coming from here. I can sail about 50 degrees to it, like I show you here. But that's not my most efficient speed. I could go a lot faster, for instance, if I fell off the wind a little bit. My boat would go a lot faster but it would put me exactly beam to the swell and that's what I'm trying to balance so my boat will balance herself 
add about 50 degrees to the wind and just chug along. But if I want to go faster, then I'm beam to the swell. And we don't want that. Okay, so this is a drawing of the swell in my boat. So the distance between the, the peaks and the swell, that's important. I call that the period. But when the swell is approaching you from this direction, it's going to, as, as a swell moves under your boat, your boat is going to roll to the port, facing away. And then when the swell passes underneath, the boat rolls the opposite way fairly quickly. And if the next swell is close, like this, then this swell is going to be on you while your boat is still heeled to starboard. And it can break and it can it can flip boats, it can submerge boats, it can do all sorts of all sorts of very bad things to your boat. So managing the sea state is every bit as important as managing the wind. And when I sail as a single hander, I try to balance the boat, but I also need to sail so that the sea state is never ever directly on my beam. Okay, yeah, so, um, my god, the first day underway was pretty rugged. <sighs> and it had been, you know, the same old thing, like, you know, look, if it's gonna just suck, maybe I don't want to do this that badly, you know, because <laughs> it did suck. The first few hours up, so there I am, three hours underway, an incredibly big swell, again, I had to use the engine to punch through a bunch of breaking waves right at the reef. It's like, jeez, I'm peeing. Um, and when it was getting dark, and I was kind of, it's kind of inspecting the boat before it got dark, dark, because I don't like going forward topside at night. Um, I hear luffing from the Genoa, and I go up there and I look, and it's just, it is luffing at the top of the sail. I kind of feel, what the hell's going on? And I realize that it had slid down a little bit and I go down and then I take a closer look and I realize the halyard broke. So the halyard that hoists the Genoa up the roller further had broken. And it was trailing in the water and oh my god so I fished all that out and I furled up the Genoa and hoisted the staysail and did all that as it was getting dark and as it was freaking pouring rain, that sucked. And then today, during the daylight, I look up and I see that my stay sail had shredded itself. And I didn't do anything to it. <laughs> I'm just happy that my mainsail doesn't have any tears. So the main is under full sail. I, I reefed the main when I first started, but I pulled out the reef today. Um, something's different. Next day turned into a flat out beautiful day. You could not ask for a more perfect set of conditions than the next day. Just gorgeous. I mean, it's a beautiful day. There's a bit of a sense of foreboding in the air because I know the winds are beautiful right now. The seas are pretty much as flat as you could ask for. I mean, there's waves, but there's no real swell to speak of. That's going to change as the wind speed increases and as it. Dum, dum, dum. Right. Well, there's no telling what I look like until I date mine. I'm drinking a beer, one thing. Um, because I need to stop and regroup. This trip has not gone well by any standard. Well, the only standard by which it's gone well has been that nobody has died yet. I haven't gone out of food yet. Nice to live here. And the boat hasn't sunk. I haven't hit anything. God damn, I'm having troubles.
So the carcass of the old mainsail is now stored on deck. The carcass of the old staysail ought to join it. There's two dead sails on one freaking trip. God damn it. And it's a giant railroad ship coming in. I'm gonna maneuver now. Okay, so my patented chart tops. <laughs> I used a highlighter to follow my line. That's what I've done. So back in that day, that's when we were completely becalmed. And I was at that point hoping to go straight in because I wanted to get above this shelf. This is a shelf where the bottom really drops out, that line there. And I knew that if I got across it, then I'm not going to be influenced hardly at all by the Gulf current, by the loop current. And the same exact thing is true. So I, here, last fix was right there. So over the night, I've been traveling northeast trying to crack that barrier again and trying to get to here. That, that's the Dry Tortugas, that's where Fort Jefferson is. And um, I mean, I'm not feeling much like a tourist right now. I'd rather do my touristing so when uh, my girlfriend gets here. But either way, I'm 22 miles away from the shelf if I can continue straight north. And I'm able to steer a little bit east of north right now. So it's only 20 miles, but the plan is to just get here and kind of get as far away from the goddamn loop current as possible, and then continue to head for the real shallows. Once I'm in this like baby blue stuff, then I'm done dealing with big waves and swell and all that stuff. And I would love to make it to Cape Sable. It all depends what the winds do. All I have is a head sail and only about uh, the first half of it. I can't unfurl the whole thing. So, it all depends on what I get for wind. If I need to, I can just motor, once I get inside, I would motor the inside to Key West, reload on diesel, and then head for Cape Sable. And that would kind of be the plan. If the winds remain brisk and from the northeast, from the east, I would just continue. I think I would do that. I, we have to think about that. But step one is to get here and get on the on this side of the dry tortugas and take a deep breath maybe even drop an anchor in the dry tortugas and just sleep a day or so that's the first thing just get off out of this gold current myself to point out that just 24 hours before this point I had just lost the mainsail and because of the awful sea state and wind combination I had initially decided to head south and east for Havana Cuba but that would have just been crossing the Gulf Stream again after I got repairs completed and I really am grateful to be back <laughs> yeah. so 
there is a philosophical thing that's been running through my head now. After my first night's troubles with the stay sail and the Genoa, then everything was fine. Nothing else broke until the mainsail ripped up a few days later. But during that time, as I was sailing, I remember repeatedly two things. Being One of them is being conscious that, you know, this sucks. You know, it is so rough that I, I wasn't having fun. You couldn't hardly leave the wheel. And if you do, you're walking through the cabin and it's very dangerous. My little portable refrigerator had flipped upside down and broke a beer that I had been saving. Specifically, my friend Marcos in Cancun gave it to me. And I said, man, when I get to Florida, I'm going to have that beer. And it was broken and a junk, a little box of milk had burst and all my eggs had crashed. And, and all that shit goes to the village. It's like, oh my God, so I'm pissed about that. But I'm, I'm actually wondering, do I need to rescale my objectives with what I think I want to do? That's the question. It's like, everybody says, I want to sail around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So am I in love with the idea of sailing around the world, or is it really the hardships that go with sailing? So this is the this is a rambling of a 58-year-old guy who is at a point where part of me says, I don't care about creature comforts and all that stuff, but I, I think I really do. I don't like going five days without a shower. You know, I don't like being dirty, and I don't like injuring myself all the time. I've hurt my hands so much every trip. So I don't know, maybe I just don't want that kind of rough life. Maybe I need to be more choosy about the sailing that I do. So anyway, that's just something out there and I'm, I've been noodling on it. And uh, here's another part of it. When the weather was rough and I'm in this swell or other things are going wrong, I I, mean, I distinctly remember cursing at the auto killer and that's why I just put it away and I cursed at a wave once you know the swell was coming in and I it was coming from the wrong freaking direction you know <laughs> it's when I was down by the Yucatan and the swell should have been on the southeast but it's not and I remember cursing and calling it bad words and as I saw the swell coming and I'm going, ah, and I find that you know, I just, I, you know, shouted, bah! you know, just way too much. So, so maybe there's something else going on here, is that they can both be fixed by me choosing easy, easy sailing, but maybe I'm not well suited to this, because there's going to be frustrations, and man, was, I don't know, I don't know, life's supposed to be easy, and life's supposed to be enjoyable. So my girlfriend and I will have a good discussion when I get to see her again. They decide, you know, what kind of sailing or cruising we want to do. You know, I want to be old school. I do like being old school. I really do. But the people who are new school probably enjoyed their trip a hell of a lot better than I did. That's the reality. One thing else I'll say is that I'd been asked over the last week when I lost the mainsail, a couple of people on uh, the satellite communications have asked me the obvious question, well, how far can you motor? Well, that's kind of a tricky question. Now, theoretically, this boat carries 48 gallons of diesel fuel, and I have 20 more gallons in jerry cans, so I've got a total of 68 gallons available. Call it 65 useful gallons, or 60. Um, and if you assume that I burn a gallon an hour, then that's about 60 hours of engine time. And if you assume I can make four or five knots at least when I'm running the engine, then I've got about 60 65 hours of engine runtime and and thereby at four or five knots you multiply that so about 240 possibly 300 miles of range but a lot depends upon the wind and sea state so if you go motoring on a day like today excuse me today you're going to get a lot further on your gallon of diesel than you would if you're slamming into the wind and into a two to four foot waves that's chop bam 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 this boat and most sailboats are not made to do that. You hear that power boat buzzing out there? He's probably got twin 300s or twin 200s of horsepowers in the back of his boat, and he can really buzz across it. But when you're on a boat with one 50 horsepower engine, 50 horsepower is all I've got, and the boat's 11 tons, you know, it is not made to go zipping across the water. So if you're asking this engine, which was fabulous today, you know, to push this boat, you know, at five knots no matter what. That, that just ain't going to happen. So 
It was a difficult question when people asked me because at that time I'm down in the Gulf Stream looking at 10 to 20 foot freaking you know, rollers, enormous waves. I thought, I mean, from trough to top, I mean, they were met past 10 feet in, in my estimation, and they and they're they're all conflicting directions, and the wind is blowing at 20 knots or 15 knots. Oh my God, I I can't even imagine trying to motor in that stuff. You'd probably sit there motoring for an hour and barely move. That's what I think would happen. So. I was able to steer, as you can see, slightly north of east until I got closer to this smaller shelf and I got I was getting pushed north and west pretty strong. So if I'm going to go ahead and draw there, there's, there's a current of about almost a knot, about 0.8 knots pushing you north and west right along this shelf. So, so I actually motored one day when it was dead calm here to try to close the distance to the beach. But I, I'll show you, you can see the heading that I made good is about 040, but I was steering 080 the whole time. That tells you what the set and the drift was. I was pointed this way, but I ended up going this way. And then the next day I sailed and sailed and sailed until I got to the point where it was completely calm. And I realized if I continue trying to sail, I'm just going to get pushed right on up to uh, Pensacola. <laughs> but I'll never actually close the coast. So at some point, there's a motoring that's going to be necessary to, to close this distance. And I decided to do it here. So starting, in, including this, 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 and this, you know, that's uh, 11 hours of diesel time. 55 miles, I think, total. So on many uh, sailing channels, um, I get frustrated because I never know exactly where the people are. So first I'll point out this is exactly how I left the chart table last, last night. My last ink was anchored, you know, and I was, I was 2111 last night. And um, actually, this anchorage was one of the p possibilities on my... Um, my uh, my nav plan. So there's Charlotte Harbor. That's pretty much where I am. I made it for the entrance marker, and I got pretty darn close. And then I I didn't go for the channel though because it was nighttime. I had one alternate path available to me, which I had prepared for. And so that's this old chart. But this is probably the world's oldest chart, but it works. And this was what I was supposed to do: is get in the channel and chug up here and go to the left or to the right. Any of those places would have suited. I was thinking more of if I had a, a strong westerly or northerly blow, where would I go hide? These would be my preferred anchorage, anchorage location, my preferred anchorages. And But I also knew that if it was dark and stormy and I didn't feel like going into that pass, if I couldn't find the buries and all that, I knew I didn't want to go through the pass at night in a blow. So, and it was a lot dark when I got here, so I got to the first set of markers um, visually, and I pass outside of them because the water is deep, and I just aim for this area, and that's about where I'm at now. So, to take a larger view, it's uh, it's right here, right outside of that pass. So I did turn on the chart powder last night, just to kind of back up my navigation when I was getting close. I mean, there really isn't a hell of a lot to screw up out here. If you get to the if you get to the Florida West Coast, baby, you're in pretty good shape. So let's zoom in the camera. Zoom out that. Okay, now you see, that's the only charts I have electronically. And I was headed here. Okay, so F, but I was out here most of the time, and when the, when the and I, I tried to cheat as closely as I could, but it was difficult with a very, very light east wind and with hardly any sails on the boat. So yesterday, when it was dead, flat, calm, I mean, it looked like mirror smooth finish on the water. That's when I drove in on the motor. So my last 40 miles was on the motor, which kind of sucked, but the um, um, engine got a good exercise, and here I am now, anchored right outside of the path. So step one is to decide. I mean, I could always undo my decision and go back on the ocean. If it's going to be easterly breeze, 
Well, shit, I'll just go up to Tampa and, 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 and go in there and, and spare myself the pain of going through the intercoastal. But on the other hand, I'm a sailboat that doesn't have all of its sails. Does, don't even have a third of my sails. I have one Genoa that can only go 50% open. So with an east wind, I could make that work, I think. But if something changed to like a north wind, then I'd be sucking life. So probably the smart play is to go in here into the channel, hang my left, just like I planned on, and anchor somewhere over here. <clears throat> That's the city of Boca Grande. And I think I'll, <clears throat> I'll, my plan is to anchor right by the number of four brewers at the number two, I forget which, but anchor here by the first or the second red out here in the deeper water and then take the dinghy in and then that's when the trip is finally over. And then the basic plan is to take the intracoastal waterway um, up and so that's what we're going to do. But when I anchor, you know, I feel better that I'm anchored but I don't celebrate and relax until I've been here a little while. I set my anchor drag alarm and I know that I'm not going to be dragging all over Kingdom Come. But it looks nice and peaceful. It looks quiet. And I assume the tourist boat activity all quiets down in the after 4 o'clock. So it should be a nice, quiet sleep. And the only question is, should I move? Because I'm going to stay a few days. So. Well, immediately, the first thing I'm going to do is get uh, Pugsley ready to go in the water. Then I'm going to clear off topside in case it should rain. I want a good wash down because this boat is covered in salt. And I hate that. So... I'm just watching my depth. I'm watching the way I'm tending. Tori, you're on read. We'll try again. Let's go to one four. One four. So, so thanks for watching. I am thankful to be here. I'm going to shave my face now, and uh, life is good. So I'm very grateful to have made the trip, even though I made it without most of my sails. Um, yeah, it's it's better than sitting in an office. Better than doing what I was doing four years ago. You know, and I wasn't happy in my previous career so life is uh, still much much improved and I have no complaints still have good health completely free to do whatever I want and I'm now close enough um, that I can confidently state that I won't miss my son's wedding which is not for another month and a half but I, I just you never know right? and I didn't want to be in any kind of position where that could possibly be in jeopardy so I feel pretty damn good so thanks for watching guys look forward to your comments send me comments i love those things you know it's like having a big batch of friends out there you know they're looking after me in some cases and that are supporting me and others and are interested so so i appreciate the comments and take care bye